everyone welcome back to my channel today we are doing my october reading wrap up and just like september i read 24 books this month and to be honest i thought i was gonna read more but i started to really slow down towards the end of the month but we are at that stage where most of my spreads have already been filled out um, again similar to september i didn't get to any of my tbrs or fill in any of my abc challenge so i'm starting to think that x and z or x and y might have to go blank this year but for my favorite book of the month, by far, Kylie Lee Baker's Scarlet Alchemist. Um, I absolutely loved it. And then for our book club selection this month, the theme is witches. And so we chose The Bone Witch by Rin Chepeco. And for October releases, I went a little bit crazy on the book buying this month because so many great releases came out. But as you can see, I'm highlighting almost all of the new releases that I have listed for the month of October. But yeah won't uh, regale you with um, some of my spending habits this month so we'll just go right in to the wrap up for October again I read 24 books and I had some good reads it wasn't as good of a reading month as September but I had some probably year favorites on this list including Scarlet Alchemist and Night Strider by Sophia Slade those were Two of my favorites this month but i also either started or completed some series this month including um, bethany jacobs sci-fi series i read the first two books in that series or in that trilogy by her and then i also um, read the full scarlet alchemist duology um, by kylie lee baker which was great i highly recommended or highly recommend that series i actually listened to both books on audiobook and the narrator is my favorite audiobook narrator natalie Nottis. so if you are familiar with her I recommend checking out her books. She also narrated the Bethany Jacobs books that I read and A Song to Drown Rivers that came out this month. So I had a lot of Natalie Nottis this month, which I wasn't upset about because she's fantastic. And uh, the first half of October was also um, Hispanic Heritage Month, so I did read quite a few more Latinx and Hispanic authors this month, and I'll go through some of those in my wrap-up. But yeah, overall, it was very fun and memorable reading month, and I have some really great books to talk about later. For the demographics of the books I read, 12 were by, were by Caucasian authors, 6 were by Latinx Hispanic authors, 4 were by API authors, 4 were by LGBTQIA authors, and 2 were by Black authors. For the genres, 16 of the books I read were fantasy, 8 were LGBTQIA+, 5 were horror, 5 were romance, 4 were YA, and 3 were sci-fi. And then for the format, 79% uh, were in audiobook format, 17% were digital, and 4% were print. And then 14 of the books I read, I checked out from my local library. I do own 16 of the books that I read, and 8 of them were ARCs, or advanced copies, that I received. 4 of them were audiobooks that I listened to through the Everand app, and then one of them was an audiobook that I listened through my Spotify subscription. And then... In terms of the ratings, this is the graph that I totally forgot to update and printed last month's chart, but for October, two of uh, the books I read, I got five stars. I had 13 four-star reads, seven three-star reads, and two two-star reads. And then for page numbers, 4% of the books I read were over 500 pages, 46% were under 300 pages, and then 50% were between 300 and 500 pages. And moving on to the final portion is the reviews. I'm doing eight reviews this month, uh, starting with The Mountain Crown by Karen Loewici. Uh, this is an epic yet compact novella that weaves an intense dragon rider quest with deep cultural lore. The story follows Meka, a member of the Baosan, a nomadic people who share a deep empathetic bond with dragons. Her mission is to capture a king dragon from the Crown Mountains to maintain the delicate balance of the land. However, Meka's journey grows more complicated when her 
compassion towards an imprisoned dragon and a Katakan war veteran named Lily draws the attention of the Imperial authorities. Joined by a Bosoan traitor, Raka, the trio embarks on a perilous adventure through treacherous landscapes and political tensions. The novella brilliantly balances action and character development with the journey itself providing a compelling backdrop to the events of the story. Overall, The Mountain Crown is an excellent emotional read. It packs a lot of rich storytelling into under 200 pages. I gave it four stars. Then we have A Song to Drown Rivers by An Liang. Inspired by the legend of Shisha, one of the famous four beauties of ancient China, A Song to Drown Rivers is a beautifully written, concise retelling. Xisha, trained to use her beauty as a weapon by the military advisor Fan Li, is a compelling protagonist whose inner conflict drives much of the emotional tension in the book. Her mission to infiltrate the court of the Wu Kingdom, seduce the king, and weaken the empire to avenge her sister's murder unfolds with palpable angst. While, thir while I thoroughly enjoyed Liang's evocative writing and the deep emotional beats, I found myself wishing the story had more room to breathe. The relationship between Xisha and Fan Li, as well as her interactions with King Fu Chai, could have been even more intense if given more time to develop. There were moments between the characters, particularly those that Shisha reflects on later, that felt fleeting. I think this story could have benefited from a longer format to fully explore these dynamics, but I still really enjoyed it and gave it four stars. Then we have A Dark and Secret Magic by Wallace Kinney. A Dark and Secret Magic is the perfect cozy witchy read, especially for the autumn season. The story follows, follows Hecate, or Kate Goodwin, a reclusive hedge witch who's quite content with her quiet life in a secluded cottage. She spends her days foraging herbs, working at her apothecary, and enjoying the solitude with only her black cat for company. But Kate's carefully constructed world begins to unravel when a familiar face from her past, Matthew Cipher, arrives seeking sanctuary. The plot is wonderfully character-driven, focusing on Kate as she's forced to confront the dark secrets her mother kept from her, as well as her complicated history with Matthew, a practitioner of forbidden magic. The tension between them simmers nicely, and I found Matthew to be a compelling and swoon-worthy love interest. Their romance adds a great layer of warmth to the story, balancing the darker elements brought by the discovery of her mother's mysterious grimoire. I gave it four stars. And then we have Monstrilio by Gerardo Simano Cordova. Monstrilio is a haunting exploration of grief, family, on the complex nature of love. After losing her 11-year-old son, Santiago, Magos takes an unimaginable step. She removes a piece of his lung, nurturing it with a fierce, instinctual love. Slowly, this fragment of Santiago grows into Monstrilio, a sentient creature Magos hides within the crumbling walls of her family's estate. Over time, Monstrilio begins to resemble Santiago, yet his dark impulses continue to threaten the family's fragile illusion of a second chance at life. Cordova's writing is lush and deeply introspective, pulling readers into the depths of a mother's grief and the surreal manifestation of her longing. The story deftly intertwines horror while examining how each member of the family copes with the void left by Santiago. Rich in allegory, Monstrilio uses its, its horror elements to reveal universal truths about the haunting per permanence of grief. This novel is a must-read for horror fans drawn to character-driven stories that blend dark fantasy with emotional depth. Cordova's unique style and brilliant exploration of human frailty make Monstralia both chilling and unforgettable. I gave it four stars. Next up is one of my favorite reads of the month, Night Strider by Sophie Slade. This is a captivating dark fantasy that plunges readers into the surreal conflict between the dream realm and the waking world. Ren, a nightmare born of human fears, is bound to the tyrannical Para Warwick, who alone has the power to cross between realms. After Ren suffers severe punishment for failing her mission, she risks everything by joining a rebellion determined to end Warwick's rule. Meanwhile, in the waking world, Prince Kane, oblivious to his father's sinister nature, is set to wed Ila Evendolson, a young queen and protector of the ancient boundary, but Ila has secrets of her own. When Kane follows Ila into the dream realm, he discovers a world far darker than he'd imagined and realizes the full extent of his father's monstrousness. Fans of One Dark Window and Melissa Blair's Halfling Saga will find Night Strider enthralling with its richly imagined world, well-developed characters, and high-stakes adventure. 
Sophia Slade expertly sets the stage for the next book, weaving an intricate tale of rebellion, secrets, and the bonds formed in the face of darkness. This is a must read for dark fantasy lovers. I gave it 5 stars. And then we have The Scarlet Alchemist by Kylie Lee Baker. This book is a gripping dive into the dark world of alchemy and ambition in Imperial China. Zalan, an ambitious young alchemist, dreams of joining the ranks of royal alchemists and providing for her struggling family. Her rare skill is raising the dead, a forbidden art keeps her family afloat, but it also draws dangerous attention. When she finally earns the chance to take the imperial exams, Zalan heads to the capital where her skills and resilience are put to the ultimate test as she competes with the country's best alchemists. However, her reputation precedes her, catching the eye of the crown prince, who enlists her help amid raising, rising threats of an assassination plot. Baker crafts a world that's as beautiful as it is treacherous, with an intricate magic system centered on alchemy alchemical practices that blend science with the supernatural. This novel is a thrilling mix of historical fantasy and high-stakes adventure, ideal for fans of complex, character-driven stories. Zalan's grit and her unyielding loyalty to her family make her an unforgettable protagonist and a story that doesn't shy away from exploring the costs of ambition. I gave it five stars. And then our final two books to review this month, we have The Bloodless Princes by Charlotte Bond. Um, Charlotte delivers another immersive read following the adventures of High Mage Seraline and her unwavering champion Sir Madely. Cursed by her predecessor in her new role and grappling with the consequences of an incident involving a particularly formidable dragon, Seraline faces a deadly challenge in the underworld. Here, she must seek an audience with the mysterious bloodless princes, rulers of the afterlife, with hopes of securing a boon that might help her return to the world of the living. But as she and Madeline soon discover, relying on ancient tales alone won't be enough. Survival will require all of Seraline's wits and more than Madeline's legendary fireborn blade. One of the most intriguing parts of The Bloodless Princes is the expanded role of dragons, a treat after their more limited presence in the Fireborn Blade. Bond's portrayal of the underworld is vivid and welcome inclusion to this story, and it is interspersed with bits of lore and myth that add depth to the world building, something I found myself enjoying more than the main plot at times. But the enduring bond between Seraline and Madeline remains compelling and their journey feels authentic as ever. I gave it 4 stars. And lastly, we have On Vicious Worlds by Bethany Jacobs. Jacobs weaves a sprawling tale of rebellion, freedom, and complex alliances. The Giovanni have finally escaped from the kingdom's oppressive control, finding refuge on a new planet. This hard-won freedom, achieved through the efforts of Cleric Chono, Caster June Ironway, and the ever-unpredictable Six, faces a precarious test when the kingdom's secretaries seek to reassert dominance over the Trouble Star systems and reclaim their control over the Giovanni. While this sequel didn't captivate me quite as much as the first book, I wouldn't call it second book syndrome. Instead, I found it somewhat bogged down by an overflow of plot lines. However, Jacobs keeps things fresh with new character introductions, particularly June's intriguing cousins and the formidable leaders of the Giovanni, who add complexity to the unfolding drama on Vicious Worlds hints at a dramatic and potentially transformative climax in the series' final book. I gave it four stars. But here is my full reading wrap-up for October 2024. As always, thank you for joining me today. I hope I gave you some inspiration for future book reads to add to your TBR. I hope to tackle my own TBR lists in the remaining months of the year. But always to show your love and support, be sure to hit that like button or subscribe to my channel. But until next time, everyone, happy reading.